This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. What I want to do now is to look at the history of theology a little bit with you. This course, History of Philosophy and Christian Thought, we're, we're looking at uh, philosophy for the most part, but I also want to give you an idea of the history of theology, uh, because theology and philosophy are all mixed up together, and theology tends to follow philosophical trends. Uh, we saw how Augustine's theology was influenced by Platonism, uh, we saw how the Nicene Creed uses uh, philosophical terms from Aristotle, like substance and person. Uh, we saw how Thomas Aquinas based much of his thought on Aristotle. And uh, so this continues on down to the present. We talked about Luther and Calvin and how they uh, suggested the alternatives and epistemology and so on. And we talked about Pascal, in whom you have a quite a, an interaction between uh, uh, theology and philosophy, the, the emphasis, Christian emphasis on, on heart knowledge and heart religion with the uh, philosophical influence, uh, emphasis on probability and so on. Now, I, I want to talk about a movement that's, that's had a huge influence upon the church, and it begins about the same time as modern philosophy does. Uh, I talked to you about Descartes and how Descartes was kind of similar to the uh, uh, original Greek philosophers, breaking away from religion, trying to think through things based on reason alone. And that began among the Greeks around 600 BC. It began again in Western Europe around 1650 with Descartes. Uh, about that same time, people were starting to rethink uh, Christian theology from the standpoint of autonomous philosophical reasoning. I mentioned deism to you a little while ago. But I want to think about... Uh, these kinds of theology a little bit more systematically here. Uh, you have Descartes, and following Descartes you have Spinoza. And I mentioned to you uh, that Spinoza was not only a philosopher, he was also kind of a biblical scholar. And in addition to his philosophical writings, he wrote a book called uh, Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Um, by the way, Wittgenstein wrote a book later on that uh, has a similar title uh, Tractatus Theologico Politicus, the Theological Political Treatise. All right? And in this Theological Political Treatise, uh, Spinoza does a certain amount of philosophy, but much of it is biblical uh, exegesis. Biblical interpretation, I won't call it exegesis, I'll call it interpretation. In that book, Spinoza tries to read the Bible like an ordinary book, not like an inspired document, but like any other ancient book that we read. And so Spinoza finds it perfectly okay to find errors in the book and to uh, uh, attribute errors to the biblical writers. Now, this, this tradition of reading the Bible just like an ordinary book begins a, a substantial theological tradition, trying to be Christian, but also trying to think autonomously. Trying to be Christian but also trying to be academically respectable. 
trying to be Christian, but trying also to go along with the fashionable intellectual trends. And I need a word that's broad enough to cover this whole tradition. And the word I've chosen is liberalism. Now, there are a lot of other words uh, that are uh, applicable. Some of them are applicable to sub-traditions sub within the liberal tradition. Uh, it's sometimes called rationalism, sometimes called deism, uh, sometimes called uh, 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 neo-orthodoxy, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and we'll, we'll distinguish different varieties of liberalism. Uh, some people, and, and among them liberals, don't like to be called liberals <laughs> for some one reason or another. But I'm going to do it because the term liberal is, is broad enough um, that uh, I, I feel comfortable, at least, in including all the thinkers uh, under that label that I want to describe as, as liberal. And, you know, there's some people who will say, well, I don't like labels. But labels are how we get to know things. And you've got to remember that labels are never perfect. They're never uh, absolutely accurate. They're ne they sometimes mislead you. But you've got to have labels. I mean, if you went into a uh, pharmacy uh, to get your pills and uh, and there were no labels on any of the bottles well you'd have an awful hard time uh, taking your medicine right uh, finding the medicine that won't kill you um, so I'm going to talk about the liberal tradition in theology which is basically the tradition of reading the Bible according to autonomous philosophical reasoning uh, some introductory things about liberal theology. Liberal theology uh, asks distinctively modern questions, questions that are different from those that were asked in the time of Thomas Aquinas, let's say. Um, and it also comes up with modern answers, see at the bottom of the screen there, it also comes up with distinctively modern answers to these questions. Now, I don't object to asking the modern questions. I think that that's part of the work of theology. It's part of the work of preachers to ask the questions that people are asking in our time. But, of course, in the liberal tradition, thinking according to autonomous thought, uh, they come up consistently with the wrong answers to those modern questions. Well, I'm not going to take much time on this. Modern questions uh, from the normative perspective, hermeneutics, uh, a lot of questions about Bible interpretation or hermeneutics. What is the central message of Scripture? How is each part of the message related to other parts? Nature of the Word of God, its identity and location, and so on. Epistemological questions, understanding the relationship between the word and the, the situation and the reader, okay? Um, good questions, I would say, and I pursue those in other books that I've written. Modern answers, however, uh, uh, under the normative perspective, modern theologians or liberal theologians, uh, I'll use those two expressions roughly synonymously, modern theologians, um, believe in intellectual autonomy, okay? Now, that's the norm. That's the normative perspective. Situational perspective, God as super transcendent and super imminent. Remember my rectangular diagram. Uh, God being a holy other, as, uh, as Kant puts it. Um, Kenoticism, meaning that when Jesus comes into the world, he loses his divine attributes and becomes holy a creature, that's a super imminence. Um, polemic against possessing, controlling, manipulating God. Existential perspective, trying to transcend the subject-object relation. We'll talk about that uh, from time to time. I, I would like to say a little bit about this uh, conservative drift, section H. Um, Remember I said that in liberal theology you have two things. You have uh, an attempt to read and understand the Bible, which has always been traditional, uh, 
and, and an attempt to think about it according to autonomous reasoning, okay, which is wrong, <laughs> which, which uh, uh, the church has always been against, which the Bible is very much against. So they're trying to come up with a credible reading of the Bible, but they're trying to do it according to autonomous reasoning, that is, reading the Bible like a purely human book, uh, reading according to uh, philo- uh, pagan philosophical, non-Christian philosophical uh, assumptions. Now, these two things, these two goals kind of go back and forth. The earliest liberals would be people like the deists, who reject special revelation entirely, you know. They, they make some pretense to uh, believing in natural revelation, but they don't believe in special revelation at all. Now, that is autonomous uh, in the extreme, but that's not a plausible way of reading the Bible. <laughs> that's not a plausible... Uh, the church can't recognize that as theology, if you simply reject Jesus, and you reject miracles, and you reject atonement, you reject everything else, the church doesn't recognize that as the gospel, <laughs> okay? So liberals, you know, they, they, they want to be up to date, and they want to be philosophical, they want to be intellectually respectable, and they want to think autonomously, but they also want to get a hearing in the church, Okay? Uh, they want to make a, a credible, a credible case for their own orthodoxy. All right. So liberalism tends to drift toward more conservative terminology. Church people didn't accept deism. So the next generation of liberals tries harder to sound orthodox. They try harder to sound biblical. And uh, what happens, for example, in Immanuel Kant, Kant is still very liberal. Kant is very, very much rejects the authority of the Bible, and he, he doesn't believe the gospel as we understand it. He believes in a kind of moralism, but, but he uses all kinds of interesting symbolism. He he talks about Christ. He says that Christ is the principle of man's moral striving, and, and Christ is uh, found in each of us, and uh, uh, Christ is struggling to bring us to perf- moral perfection, and so on and so forth. And he's able to use a lot of traditional theological terminology. And so Kant sounds much more orthodox than the deists did. I don't think he he is more orthodox. I I think it's just a difference in terminology. But as you look at the history of liberal theology, you find a drift toward more and more conservative-sounding language, okay? Language that may appear to be orthodox. Uh, So Kant sounds more orthodox than the deists did. And uh, Schleiermacher sounds more orthodox than Kant, and Bart sounds more orthodox than Schleiermacher, and Pannenberg sounds more orthodox than Bart, and uh, you know there are a few glitch- glitches in this pattern, <laughs> what I call the conservative drift. Um, I-, I think it continues on and on, but every now and then you run into a, a-, a kind of break in the line, you know. A kind of a spurt where people decide they really want to go big on the autonomy side, such as Christian atheism in the 1960s. Now, Christian atheism didn't make any pretense of being orthodox. Well, I made a slight pretense. Well, I'll talk about that with you. But nobody gave them any credence. Secular theology in the 70s where, where they said that uh, uh, the church ought to follow the secular world, that wasn't very plausible. But it was their very, you know, the, 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 they failed to convince the church that they were had any biblical integrity at all, that they lost their following, they lost their popularity. And so you get people then like Pannenberg and 
Moltmann who, who sound a lot more orthodox. So that's what, when I say the conservative drift, when I talk about that, what I mean is that from the beginning of liberal theology in the 17th century down to the present, there's a general tendency for liberal theology to sound more and more conservative, to sound more and more orthodox. Now, the first form of liberal theology, uh, now I'm going to move historically, the first form of liberal theology is what I call Enlightenment rationalism. And this is a movement that exists through the 17th and 18th centuries. I think Spinoza is one of the first of these, although there were others who were contemporary with Spinoza that would also fit into this category, uh, uh, like Hobbes and, uh, and Simon. And uh, also the group of deists that I mentioned in connection with Butler, like Cherbury, Toland, Tyndall, and so on, and the Cambridge Platonists, uh, Cudworth, Witchcote, and others. These are people who say that natural theology is sufficient for the knowledge of God. Uh, and, and remember the deists. Natural theology is all we have. Uh, we can prove from nature that there's a God who exists. And uh, we don't need uh, that God to speak to us. We don't need any special revelation. We don't need the Bible. Uh, reason has the right autonomously uh, to determine who God is and whether he exists and what he's like. Uh, reason has the right autonomously to evaluate any purported revelation. Now, this is called the historical critical method of biblical criticism, which begins with Spinoza and Rai Maris. Uh, the uh, 18th, uh, 17th and 18th century rationalists reduce theology to essential truths that are derivable from nature. There is a God. Uh, he created and sustains the world. He desires worship and morality. He gives rewards and punishments. So we saw Butler trying to uh, uh, counter that kind of view. My evaluation, in some ways, this is the most liberal form of liberalism. This leaves nothing. <laughs> it, uh, there's no incarnation here, there's no trinity, there's no son of God, there's no virgin birth, there's no miracles, there's no uh, atonement, there's no uh, resurrection, there's no ascension, there's no coming again. This takes the whole gospel, all the, uh, and this is Christianity without Christ. I mean, my, Michael Horton wrote a book called Christless Christianity. I didn't like that book very much. I, I reviewed it negatively. But uh, uh, this is real Christless Christianity, this uh, uh, Enlightenment rationalism, uh, really uh, uh, d dismisses, uh, rejects everything that's distinctive to Christianity. Uh, God uh, does uh, no special revelation, no miracles. He doesn't enter history. Arguably, he's impersonal, but uh, at least he has some moral judgment. And uh, God uh, transcendent, God imminent, uh, uh, transcendent, uh, he, he never comes into history, but uh, God imminent, uh, the natural laws are absolutized and deified. Uh, it's a religion of works righteousness, basically, like Judaism, like Islam. You just do the best you can and hope that God will judge your, your works uh, favorably. Now, there's a figure that I think is very important. I don't have a whole lot to say about him. But uh, in, the, in the course of the history of liberalism, you have to remember him. And I'm going to be referring to him from time to time, so don't, uh, don't forget this name, the name of Gotthold Lessing, and you see his dates there. Lessing is not a biblical scholar, and he's not really a theologian. He's kind of a literary critic, and he goes around uh, evaluating people's writings and uh, said that he was seeking truth through public debate. He, uh, in a kind of tricky way, he published the writings of H.S. 
Roy Morris, who was one of the early, earliest and most radical critics of the Bible. Um, and uh, Roy Morris was advocating a critical approach to Scripture. Uh, Lessing was taking himself off the hook uh, he published this as somebody else's, uh, pu- published Ry Morris's work without commenting all that much uh, on it, but trying to promote uh, the approach of Ry Morris uh, among the public. Uh, Lessing believes that no religion possesses the truth. Uh, God reveals himself in many different religions, and he reveals uh, only what man can assimilate in a particular situation. He reveals himself one way to the Jews, one way to the Chinese, one way to the Indians at different points in history. Uh, And uh, uh, he reveals what man is able to uh, understand and and assimilate and make use of. Uh, Lessing thinks that Judaism and Christianity are kind of important, but they are preliminary stages to a higher kind of religion, uh, which he calls the gospel of reason. How do you know what religion is best? Here we are surrounded by all these different views, all these different religions, all these different philosophies. How do we know which one is best? How do we know which one we should believe in? well, Lessing would probably say the gospel of reason, of course, my religion. But how can you know? And Lessing picks up the verse, by their fruits you shall know them. And he applies it this way. He says, uh, you go around all the different religions, and you ask, how do the people behave? He tells a parable about uh, a rich man who, who has a magic ring, And he has three sons. And uh, he says that he's giving the ring to to one of his sons. But uh, because of their rivalry and so on, what what he does is he gets three rings. And and, uh, he gets a ring for each son. How do you know which ring is the true magic ring? Well, there's no way of knowing by the appearance of the ring. Uh, They're all more or less the same. Uh, But the power of the ring is to improve the behavior of the people. So the one that behaves the best, the one that makes the best contributions, is the one that has the magic ring. Now Lessing says the the Christian religion, uh, or all the religions are like that. You know, God gave some revelation to the Jews and some to the Muslims and some to the Christians and of course some to Lessing and Lessing's Gospel of Reason, and uh, so uh, so you uh, and how do you know which one is best? You you know what's best by the behavior of the people. You don't know. It, it's not helpful to uh, figure out uh, which one is best by judging miraculous attestation. People are saying this about Christianity. They, they say, well, you've got to be a Christian because uh, in the Bible, and, and some people, of course, thought after the Bible was completed, there's so many miracles that testify to the truth of Christianity. And Lessing says, how can that be? I mean, we don't have uh, uh, miracles today, do we? What we have are miracle reports now, it may be that if you saw a miracle up close, that would persuade you. But we don't have that. We just have reports of miracles. And then he says this, and this is very important. He says, if no historical truth can be demonstrated, then nothing can be demonstrated by means of historical proofs. That is, the accidental truths of history can never become the proof of necessary truths of reason. Okay? It says a number of things there. First, uh, you cannot demonstrate any historical truths. Okay? I believe that Columbus discovered America. <laughs> Columbus was the first European 
since uh, Leif Erikson, maybe, <laughs> to discover America. I can't prove that the way I can prove 2 plus 2 is 4. You know, uh, so I can't absolutely prove that Columbus discovered America or any other historical fact that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Can't absolutely prove that uh, the way I would prove a mathematical proposition or a proposition of logic. Um, so I, I can't prove any, and, and so I can't prove, and this is Lessing reasoning again, I can't prove that Jesus turned the water into wine, right? I wasn't there. I can't demonstrate that. Now, that being the case, I can't be absolutely sure that Jesus did it. I can't be absolutely sure that he was God in the flesh. I can't be absolutely sure that he was raised from the dead. So how can I prove from his resurrection, from the story of his resurrection, that I ought to believe in him? I can't use that historical event to prove anything that I should believe today. Furthermore, uh, now you, you see uh, Lessing uses this phrase, the accidental truths of history. History is not like mathematics. Two plus two is four. Well, that's necessary. Uh, two plus two could not be otherwise. It could not be anything else than four. But when you're talking about history, you're talking about events that might have been different. Okay, so Columbus discovered America. It might have been somebody else. Or Columbus might have stayed home. So it's not necessary. Remember our distinction between necessary and contingent some time ago? Uh, it's not necessary that Columbus came to this country. <clears throat> so all the truths of history are accidental. This is the opposite of necessary. They're accidental. They might have been otherwise. And this is another reason why they're not certain. You, you can't be absolutely sure what happens in history. Now, so here we are today, and we're faced with this history of things that might have happened, maybe didn't happen, and we're trying to believe and, and a lot of people claim that you become a Christian on the basis of history. How can that be? Lessing says that if you're going to, if, if you're going to uh, give your life to some religion, it has to be based on reason. It has to be something necessary. Okay, he, he's following the the Enlightenment rationalists, and. Uh, it has to be based on reason, like 2 plus 2 is 4. It has to have this kind of certainty about it. But all we have are accidental uh, facts, facts that might have been otherwise, facts that aren't so certain. And how can we get rational truth out of accidental facts? Well, you just can't. And so Lessing says that historical truths and metaphysical moral truths, religious truths, are in two entirely different categories. That, then, is the ugly great ditch. This is a famous quote from Lessing, and I'll be referring to it from time to time. This is the ugly great ditch which I cannot cross however often and however earnestly I have tried to make this leap. Okay? So there's this, this great ditch, all right? Here's history. Here's faith. And for Lessing, remember, faith has to be based on reason. Faith has to be absolutely certain. Between these, a great ditch, all right? And you can't leap across it. So there can be no such thing as a historical basis for faith. How often have you heard somebody say uh, the basis of Christianity is, uh, uh, is the resurrection of Christ? 
Christianity is certain because it's based on historical facts. Lessing is combating that idea head on. Faith cannot be based on history because of the nature of history. History is just a bunch of accidental happenings uh, that have no certainty about them, and uh, they can't therefore be made the basis for anything rational and certain. And faith has to be based on what's rational and certain. Now that, that poses a problem. Since the time of Lessing, everybody is trying to find a way to deal with this ditch. Okay? Kant, Schleiermacher, uh, Hongernack, Ritchell, uh, Bart, uh, Pannenberg, everybody is trying to deal with this ditch. And most of them simply agree with Lessing. Most of them agree that you can't get from here to here. And so they try to develop a version of Christianity that's not based on history. At least it's not based on ordinary history. It's not based on past history. It's not based on events of past calendar time. Sometimes they try to... uh, uh, de- try to develop a special concept of history, like Bart's uh, Geschichte, or uh, uh, Bruner's I Thou Realm, or uh, Bultmann's Heilsgeschichte. Uh, uh, they may try some new kind of history, but they don't take ordinary history and try to build faith on that ordinary history. Now, that is a profoundly unorthodox claim. I think the most obvious thing about Scripture, well, I won't say the most obvious, but <laughs> what is absolutely obvious about Scripture is that our salvation is based on historical events. It's based on things that took place uh, many years ago. And uh, it's based on the cross of Christ. It's based on the resurrection of Christ. And if Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is vain and we are yet in our sins. Uh, So our faith today, it's a scandal. Here we are in the 21st century. It's based on something that happened in the 1st century A.D. Uh, And uh, Lessing denies that and... uh, Most everybody in the liberal tradition who comes after Lessing also denies that, and they try to find some way to deal with Lessing's ditch. Well, Lessing himself dealt with it this way. Number four under D, what does bind me? Nothing but the teachings themselves. But what does it matter to me whether the story is false or true? Its fruits are excellent. So there's the parable of the rings again doesn't matter uh, whether it's the magic ring or not. Uh, what matters is the way people behave. doesn't matter whether these uh, miracles happened or not. The important thing is how do people behave. That's the whole story so far as Lessing is concerned. How do I evaluate people's behavior? Well, just by my own Mind, what does it bind me? Nothing but the teachings themselves. So here I am autonomously evaluating the teachings, evaluating the behavior of people, and choosing my religion on the basis of the way people behave. And that's the heart of theological liberalism. That's the principle that comes up again and again. See my comments there. Enormously influential upon later theology, motivated liberal theologians to abandon any historical basis for the Christian faith. Do I think historical truth can be demonstrated? Yes, I do. Because uh, uh, for me, the Bible itself is the supreme presupposition by which I evaluate history. Okay? Uh, and and you've got to face that, you know, unless, you, unless you're basing all your thought on the Bible. Uh, without compromise. Uh, You don't have any reason for uh, saying that uh, these events took place and that these events form the basis of salvation. Unless we have Scripture as an epistemological principle, we will not have the gospel. A lot of people running around saying we don't need 
epistemology. All we need is redemptive history. I say we need biblical epistemology as a foundation for redemptive history. Um, and if, uh, if the Bible is our source of demonstration, then we can demonstrate that what, what happened in history. Uh, the, the miracles of Jesus are not just accidental happenings that may or may not have happened that don't have any certainty about them. They certainly happened because God has told us so in his word. And that's not the way Lessing reasons, but that's the way we have to reason. And, and we can be thankful to Lessing for showing us that, that we need to have a basis for making historical claims. And that has to be a Christian basis, and that has to be a biblical basis. So number four, can historical truth provide a basis for metaphysics and ethics? Can it produce a basis for, for eternal life? Can it produce something that you can give yourself heart and soul to? Yes, it can. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.